Good morning. Happy Saturday to everybody. Part three of the new technician course. We're going to get started here in just one minute. Our no just went off and told me it was 10 a.m., so I guess that's good enough. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, Ham Radio 2.0, part three of the new technician course. I'm going to give you a brief rundown, then I'm going to bring Chris on real quick. Uh, we started this on Thursday night. We did part one on Thursday. It was about four hours. We did part two last night. It was about three hours, and today's should be probably about three hours, maybe a little bit less today. This is the last part. Uh, this is all of the information you need detailed down to the nub for the uh, technician question pool, which technician is your first level of license. And this question pool is good from 2022, last year, until about July of 2026. So at the time of this recording, you've got three years to learn this information. I was told, I was, I went to the, I went to breakfast this morning with the Hearst Amateur Radio Club, just uh, here locally, which they do that breakfast every Saturday morning. If you're in the uh, mid-cities, North Texas area, they do invite people out to that. Uh, I was told that uh, Paul, the uh, current president of the club, said that he is happy to set up a testing session next week sometime for anybody who wants to um, test after this, uh, the, these three classes that we've done on the channel. Uh, for the last three days. So if anybody's interested in that, you can reach out to me, put a link, uh, put a, a comment in the chat, uh, put a comment in the video itself, and uh, and we'll get you connected up with the right um, right group. Uh, the Their website, w5hrc.org, is listed in the description of this video and all three videos in the series, so you can always find them through their website as well. All right, let's bring Chris in there. What's going on, man? How are you? Doing well. How are you? Yeah, I'm... I'm happy because I got some <laughs> breakfast this morning. <laughs> no kidding. Pretty good, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Paul called me. He's like, man, I forgot to tell you at breakfast. So he's like, yeah, we'll set up a testing session for anybody who wants to to come out there. So, um, but that's good. So, all right, man, we'll just uh, hop right into it, take it away, and uh, I'll be sitting here in the background. Sounds good. Let me get my... Oh, Did I tell you? Oh, I got I to gotta turn on sharing. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it would be on by default, but... I see why it's not. Oh, just a second. It's not cooperating sure. here. That's no, fine. That's fine. <laughs> Side booms in the chat. Someone tag ape so we can get him licensed. Oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Smoking ape needs this class. Oh, good stuff. Uh, I like his. I like his channel. Yeah, yeah, he's got a good channel. All, all right. Man, it's all you. Cool. All right. Thanks. Well, we'll uh, welcome to, to session three. Hopefully, I haven't scared uh, too many people off. Um, this class, like Jason said, um, brought to you by the the Hearst Hearst Radio Club in uh, Hearst, Texas. We uh, we are using the book, the uh, the yellow book here, shown on your screen. Um, and uh, I'll remind you one more time: this is a supplemental to this book, so you do need to read it, even though we are going to go through all the, uh, the basically all the material. Uh, just a, a supplement to hopefully help you learn the the information rather than just rather than just um, um, you know memorizing the questions. So, all right, <clears throat> this is my favorite day. We get uh, a lot of fun things, some antennas, some coax, and so uh, let's let's get right in. All right, we uh, we did a lot of electrical uh components and things yesterday we have a little bit more um no no more math but uh so whenever you you buy a radio oftentimes they'll come with a uh, a schematic which is basically uh kind of think of it a, a, a road map that'll show you all of the different parts and and pieces and components like resistors capacitors this little uh diagram here actually has some of the most common there are a lot more than this but uh, these are some of the the common ones that you'll see. We got resistors, switches, batteries, grounds, you know, etc. There. So, this is what you will see on a schematic uh, diagram itself. The symbols on an electric circuit uh, schematic diagram represent 
each different component. Sorry, I got to make a, a quick change here. Okay. Uh, okay, so here we go. Back and forth, back and forth. Here we go. All right. So whenever you are given the test, you will see something along this line here. Um, these components, you, you need to have a kind of a, a basic understanding of what each one of them is, so you you'll have an idea. Because this is one of the one of the questions here that you'll see. You know, given the component number three in Figure T three, this is going to be a variable inductor, and that one is going to be uh, as you can see, component three right there. It was supposed to be a line pop up, but it didn't. Uh, component number four, all the way up there on the top right. That is an Intel. What is going on here, guys? I apologize. I'm, some things going crazy. Uh, okay, so component four up there in figure T3, that is going to be the representation for an antenna. Um, these are very common things that you'll see um, in, in many schematics. Even in block diagrams, you might see uh, some of these just as a, as a representation. So a capacitor is used together with an inductor to make a tuned circuit. And these are some examples of a uh, uh, of some some of the capacitors and the inductors. If you look on the uh, the le the left one here, this is going to be the um, uh, the inductor and then up on top of that is a capacitor. That's going to be a tuned circuit. Now Talking about a tuned circuit, what is what is a, a tuned circuit? Um, a tuned circuit is going to be an electrically conducting pathway containing both inductive and capacitive elements, uh, both of those components. Uh, when these are connected in series, the the circuit will present a low impedance um, to a, to an AC current of a resonant frequency. Basically, let me simplify that. We will use a tuned circuit um, in antennas heavily. You'll find a lot of antennas with coils with adjustable um, uh, little clips that uh, you can kind of go up and down to, to really help you get the lowest impedance and the best match for your antenna. Uh, a simple, simple resonant or tuned circuit consists of an inductor and a capacitor connected in series and parallel. Uh, don't let this uh, s scare you here. This is just giving some examples of of the resonance and the formulas. If you're interested in that, you can take a, a screenshot of that. But this is uh, this is basically what you need to know is these two connected together in series and parallel is going to give you a tuned circuit. Component number one in this figure that's about to pop up is going to be a resistor. Component number two, or excuse me, component number two, that is going to be a transistor. And then the fo the actual function of component number two and figure and, and T1 here is to control the flow of current. So as we said, a, a transistor will either act as an on off switch or it will uh, control current. And then component number three up here at the very top, that's going to be an uh, be a lamp. That that particular one is going to be just a a little wire, you know, incandescent lamp. It's not an LED. LED will have a different uh, symbol. Figure four over here. This is a battery. So you may be presented, or you will be presented with a question on the test with this little figure or something like it that will ask you, it'll say, what's, what is component one? What is component two? What, you know, any of these, and you'll have to answer that. So kind of familiarize yourself with the, uh, with those, that, that list of components that I showed earlier. Um, that diagram is also in your book. Uh, some switches here, a single pole, single throw switch is represented in uh, component three um, in the first, uh, the little top left area up there. And basically a single circuit switches between one or two other circuits. Circuits, cir circuits is accomplished by a single pole double throw switch. And that is represented here. It's not on off. It's or so either you know selection one or selection two compared to 
on or off. Uh, component four in T2. So that is, where is component four? Right in the middle between those, that's going to be a transformer. Uh, transformers have a specific duty, and we'll talk about that here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, component number six is a capacitor. And all of these are standard. You won't see, you know, st strange looking things that uh, that we're not covering here on the test. You will you will see these components, and you will be asked um, maybe a couple of these questions specifically. Component eight and T two is a light emitting diode. So if you look at number eight, that's the diode signal, but it's also got some little arrows coming off it. That's a LED. Uh, one of two um, LED uh, representations here. Uh, component nine in figure T2, where is that? That is going to be a variable resistor. Variable resistor is also known as a potentiometer. So maybe a volume control or uh, a brightness of a, of, a, of, an, uh, of a light or something like that is what that would be used for. Um, a meter can be used to display signal strength on a, numer a numeric scale. So looking at this a little screenshot here, this is actually a screenshot of a radio, if I if I'm, I believe. Um, and that will give you, you know, display whatever information in a numeric scale. An electronically controlled switch is a, basically it's a relay. Um, it is a miniature switch that is used to control a high current uh, switch. So you actually interact like you're, you're the ignition in your car. That is a relay. You turn that on. You're turning on a small switch, which energizes a large, uh, a large relay somewhere in your in your car. That way, you don't have a lot of high voltage going through your key. A regulator is going to be a type of circuit that controls the amount of voltage from a power power, uh, power supply. So you'll oftentimes see um, uh, power supplies that will say regulated power supply, and that's that's just using some components in there to make it a nice, clean signal, make it where it's not, you know, your voltage is not fluctuating and your your amperage is not fluctuating. It's it's a nice, it's a clean signal essentially. Uh, we talked about. A transformer. This is a uh, a oftentimes large and very heavy component. I mean, by heavy, I mean you know two, three, ten pounds, depending on the size of it. And what it does is it will change 120 volt AC to a lower or higher voltage, depending on what type it is. In this particular one here, it's going to lower the AC voltage um, for uses in a in a a uh, circuit uh, needs a lower voltage instead of 100 volt AC. The name of a device that combines several semiconductors and other components into one package is is called an integrated circuit. So you take all of these components, um, these little semiconductors right here, get on a board, they're connected in a uh, little logic in there. That's an integrated circuit. Changing direction just a little bit, five watts. We're going to talk about decibels, de decibels. Um, decibels is going to be uh, in both RF and electrical. It's going to be a measure of power. So uh, five watts, if you uh, increase that to 10 watts, that's a power of three dB, three decibels. A, an increase of three decibels is a double. Uh, an in, an in Increase of um, to six is going to be multiple of four. Nine is going to be um, eight, and so on and so forth. So uh, we measure electrical power, and also we measure uh, antenna gain in decibels. And you'll see that whenever you're looking at antennas to, to buy, you'll see, hey, this one has a three dB gain. Basically, means you're sending ten, you know, five watts in, and if it has a three dB gain, the antenna is naturally doubling that just it's just part of the actual uh, how the antenna is built. A power increase from 12 watts to 3 watts represents a power decrease of 6, negative 6 dB, excuse me. So that's, you know, halving that and then halving that, that's going to pick you on 6. So 6 dB is a 
four time power change. Um, and then an increase from 20 watts to 200 watts represents a power increase of 10 dB. And if you if you can look at this little chart here and uh, and kind of memorize some of these, basically every 3 dB is going to double um, is is the best way to remember that because um, you will you will see that throughout your ham career. A device commonly used as a visual indicator is an LED. Uh, you provide power and it works just like a, well, functionally, it works like a, a light bulb, but it uh, uses, you know, electronic ch uh, chips to produce the light. It's a much, much more efficient, very, a lot more efficient um, light compared to uh, a traditional incandescent. Um, so the forward current causes a light emitting diode. Now you have to remember a, light, a diode is a check valve, a one way check valve. So uh, you do have to install them the proper way. They will have the uh, the marker telling you which way current is supposed to flow through them in order to get your lights, uh, get the light to to emit. So that is a um, how basically how an LED functions. Um, you don't have to know the individual parts and pieces like it's got in this graphic that's just a representation of how it works so you don't need to know each individual piece like that until you get up into into your extra class where you got to name every single little piece another way to specify a radio frequency of one one uh, fit one million five hundred hertz is fifteen hundred kilohertz also known as one point five megahertz just a uh, just as another way that you can refer to refer to that. Um, if a frequency readout readout is showing a reading of two thousand four hundred twenty five or twenty four twenty five megahertz, you can also read that as two point four two five gigahertz. So you kilo, mega, giga, what's the next tera, and so on and so forth. There are one thousand volts and one kilovolt just uh, if you're familiar with how you know kilobytes and stuff like that that's the same thing uh as far as the uh the, the kilo portion of thousand volts in a kilovolt a million in a megavolt and and so on so you use an ammeter um and if it's a if the ammeter is calibrated in amps to use to measure a 300 milliamp current here's what it would show three amps you don't when you get into a, a, a the larger equipment um it may break it down into milliamps uh but if you're if you're you talk about larger uh power it, it may measure it in you know three amps like this so uh that's that's how you'd want to read it. three thousand milliamps is the exact exact same thing as three amps so 28,400 kilohertz is equal to to 28.4 megahertz so a little bit of uh uh math or you know, decimal shifting there to uh to get to that but it's uh those those represent the same thing 500 milliwatts what is that equivalent to that's going to be half a watt 500 milliwatts is one half watt uh same thing one and a half amp is the same as one 1,500 milliamps. On batteries, you will oftentimes find it in milliamps. Uh, so that's just a, a way that you can reference that. One million picofarads. One million picofarads is equivalent to a microfarad. And if you remember, we, we measure capacitors in um, farads. So microfarad farad is what that's supposed to say. And you'll have no idea what I'm talking about. There we go. Uh, so one million picofarads is the equivalent to one microfarad over fard. One millionth of a volt. One millionth of a volt equals one microvolt. And this is going to be a little, uh, this is also in your book, but this will give you a representation of how to, how to think about these and how to, uh, uh, really 
memorize them. So it goes all the way from, uh, you know, don't micro, nano, pico, femto, ato, uh, all the way up to uh, exo, uh, ex exa, um, depending on what it is that you're you're measuring there. So um, this is a, a little, like I said, it's a it's in your book, and you can reference that uh, kind of just kind of have an idea of what it is that you're 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 doing as far as the calculation. So in your ham career, there's a really good chance that you're going to do some soldering. Um, for the type of things that we do in radio and electronic use, um, rosin core sold solder, solder is going to be the best type of solder uh, to use. And the reason is there's another kind out there. It's called acid core. Um, over time, acid core will actually kind of grow little fingers just it's just the the property of of it it'll grow little fingers and eventually those fingers will uh connect and it will cause a short so if you can use rosin core solder um lead tin combination that's going to give you the best results um for radio use those the the lead the rosin core with lead and tin doesn't it doesn't do the, grow the little fingers and cause shorts out so um while you're doing a, a grainy uh, soldering a grainy or a dull surface is what we call a cold solder joint it's it's it is a uh it is a solder joint it's not a clean solder joint so uh this is basically what this is is it's created because the solder wasn't really hot enough it was hot enough to melt but it wasn't really hot enough to um wick down into the circuit components itself and it'll be a, a dull um kind of a grainy appearance it won't be real reflective um out of a like you would get out of a, a good solder joint so uh that's going to be what a cold solder joint is and and soldering just takes practice so i would recommend just giving it a try because you will oftentimes solder um uh, coax connections or in this case you know electrical connections if you're if you're trying things so you you don't really want a cold solder joint you want a good clean uh, solder joint and that you know that will take some practice voltage and resistance these are going to be measured using a multimeter we talked a little bit about this yesterday left one is going to be an analog and the right one is going to be digital they both give you the same information one of them is a little bit easier to interpret compared to the other um, some people prefer analog some people prefer digital there's nothing wrong with either one of them uh, it's just whatever you prefer. So take precautions when measuring a circuit resistance to ensure that the circuit is not powered. If you try to measure the resistance on a circuit uh, on a on a resistor and it's got power, uh, you may let the smoke out and you'll end up having to desolder that component and putting a new one in because uh, uh, it will it will start to heat up and eventually it will melt itself and let out the, uh, let out the smoke. So just be careful. A circuit must not be powered whenever you're doing, whenever you're, you're measuring the, the uh, resistance. Measuring voltage when using the resistance setting will damage your multimeter unless there's some sort of perfect uh, protection in it. So, the multimeter is not expecting to have voltage coming in, and so it has specific settings, and it could uh, uh, it could also let out the smoke, and uh, you don't want to let out the smoke because that's what keeps everything together, as as we like to say. When an ohmmeter connected across an unpowered circuit initially indicates a low resistance, and then shows an increasing resistance with time. This this is going to be the indication that your your circuit has a capacitor. A capacitor again, what it does is it will take a little bit of voltage, take that in, it will store it, and uh, it is designed to take all of that you know the, all of that build up, hold on to it, and then it can release it all at once. And so takes all that little charge and then clumps together and then it will release it as a as a big charge so instead of it your circuit having you know three volts coming in it will do that and it, it could release you know easily 
75,000 volts or just as an example. So be careful with those, but that, that may give you, that, that may make it look like your, um, your, your circuit is something maybe off. It may look like it as because the, the resistance just keeps climbing. Okay. So some of the questions. What is the name of an electrical wiring diagram that uses standard component symbols? Build materials, uh, connector pinout, schematic, or flow chart? We specifically talked about a schematic and looked at some of the, uh, some of the examples. Uh, which of the following is accurately represented in an electrical schematic? Wire length, physical appearance of the components, component connections, or all of these are correct. A schematic is designed to show you the interconnected parts and pieces. Um, you can't lay it down on a uh, on a, uh, a printed circuit board, and and it's designed to show you what is connected with the other uh, other pieces. Uh, looking at this, what is component three in Figure T three? Connector, meter, variable capacitor, or a variable inductor? going to be a variable inductor right there. We use those in antennas a lot. What is component four in T3? Antenna, transmitter, dummy load, or ground? That's going to be an antenna. That's the symbol for antenna. That's one of two antennas uh, that you can have those, you know, one or the other. Um, but in this case, that's what it's going to look like there. Which of the following is combined with an inductor to make a resonant circuit? A resistor, a zinnier diode, a potentiometer, or a capacitor? Talked about that a little bit. When you combine a inductor and an inductor with a capacitor, that's when you get your tuned uh, or your tuned or resonant circuit is another name you can call it. Which of the following is a resonant or tuned circuit? It's an inductor and a capacitor in series or parallel. Linear voltage regulator, a resistor circuit used for reducing standing wave ratio, or a circuit designed to provide high fidelity audio. Um, none of those B, C, or D have any any uh, anything to do with tuned circuits. It's going to be A, inductor and a capacitor in series or parallel. Uh, what component is number one in figure T1? Number one right there are kind of in the, the top middle right there. Resistor, transistor, battery, or connector. That is the signal or the uh, symbol for a resistor. What is component two in figure T1? Resistor, transistor, uh, indicating lamp, or connector. That is going to be a transistor. And that is a NPN transistor, if you remember why, because it's not pointing in. That's a little bonus information there for you. Uh, what is the function of component two in figure T1? Uh, give off light when current flows through it, supply electrical energy, control the flow of current, or convert electrical energy into radio waves. That one is going to be to control the flow of current. That is a transistor, again. Uh, what is component three in figure T1? The wrist resistor, transistor, lamp, or ground symbol? Number three up there on top, that's going to be a lamp. Uh, what is component four in T1? Resistor, transistor, ground symbol, or battery? That's going to be a battery, and if you look at those lines, those lines do matter when you're looking at a uh, uh, at a schematic. You know, you can put the batteries in backwards, and it won't work. Uh, that that those lines do matter, which as to which way they go in. Uh, and the type of and in, in type of switch, what type of switch is represented by component three in Figure T two? So three is up there on the top of the left one right there. What is that? Is that a single pole, single throw, a single pole, double throw, double pole, single throw, or double pole, double throw? Well, tongue twister there. Answer is going to be A, 
That is a single pole, single throw switch. One switch controlling one device. What is the function of a single pole dual throw, dual throw switch? A uh, single circuit is open and closed. Two circuits are open and closed. A single circuit is switched between one of two other circuits. Or two circuits are each switched between one of two other circuits. That one's going to be C. A single circuit is switched between one of two other circuits. It's, it's not an on-off switch. It's a which one is it switch. Uh, what is component four in T2? Component four in T2, right there in the middle. What is that? A variable inductor, double pulse switch, potentiometer, or a transformer? That one is going to be a transformer, and it's designed to take AC voltage and either upscale it or down down uh, scale it, depending on what the circuit needs. What is component six in figure T2? A resistor, capacitor, regulator, IC, or a transistor? Number six is going to be a capacitor. Right there we go. Uh, what is the component eight in figure T2? Figure eight is uh, connected to the, the ground right there. Is that a resistor, inductor, regular IC, or an LED? Answer is, that is a light emitting diode, a diode or an LED. That one is, uh, you can tell that's a an LED because it's got the little little arrows there next to it you know, representing light. What is component 9 in figure T2? Is that a variable capacitor, inductor, resistor, or transformer? All these variables. Uh, that one is going to be a variable resistor, also known as a potentiometer. Got a little, go a little quicker than that. Uh, which of the following displays an electrical quantity as a numeric value? A potentiometer, a transistor, a meter, or a relay? Which one is that? That was going to be a meter. Uh, what is a relay? Relay uh, is an electrically controlled switch, a current controlled amplifier, an optical sensor, or a pass transistor. That one is going to be an electrically controlled switch. It's usually like, you know, like in your car, you turn your key, that's a small switch, which controls a larger switch, electric electrically controlled switch. What type of circuit controls the amount of voltage from a power supply? A regulator, oscillator, filter, or phase inverter. It's going to be a regulator. That, that smooths out the uh, the current and the uh, the voltage to make it a clean clean power. Uh, what component changes 120 volt AC power to a lower AC voltage for other uses? Variable variable capacitor, transformer, transistor, or diode. This one's going to be the transformer. That's where you know you can take 120 volts and either step it down or you can step it up for whatever. In this case, lower AC voltage, so it will step it down to whatever the needed voltage is. What is the uh, the name of the device that combines several semiconductors and other components into one package? You take all this stuff and and you you combine it into one package. What do we call that? A transducer, multipole multipole relay, integrated circuit, or transformer? That is going to be an integrated circuit. A little bit of decibels here. So which decibel value most closely represents a power increase from 5 watts to 10 watts? So what was that I said? Uh, how 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 many decibels is, represents a double? Is it 2, 3, 5, or 10? It's going to be 3 decibels. Every 3 decibels is a doubling in, in power. Uh, which decibel value most clo closely represents a power decrease from 12 to 3 watts? Negative 1, negative 3, negative 6, or negative 9. So we're going from 12, we're decreasing that by half, and then half again. That's going to be 6, negative 6 decibel, excuse me. Uh, negative 6, so we, we cut it in half and cut it half again. Which decibel value represents a power increase from 20 watts 
to 200 watts, 10, 12, 18, or 28. B10 dB is the proper answer. So you just have to kind of kind of learn those, uh, be familiar with them by reading that chart that we went over earlier. Um, maybe some flashcards. You don't have to memorize them extensively, but just be very familiar with you know how how the decibel system works. Which of the following is commonly used as a visual indicator? An LED, an FET, a Zenier diode, or a bipolar transistor? going to be an LED. Um, none of the other ones will output light. So an LED. What causes an LED to emit light? Is it forward current, reverse current, capacitive, cap capacitively coupled RF signal, or an inductively coupled RF signal? It's going to be the forward current going through. It only goes through one way, and the, uh, the LED will tell you which way that is. So what is equal to 1,500,000 hertz? What is that conversion here? Which one is that? 1,500 kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, or 150 kilohertz? Let me 150 kilohertz. Excuse me. Excuse me. 1,500 kilohertz. Let me make sure I state that correctly. 1,500 kilohertz is the same thing. What is equal to 2,425 megahertz? In this example, 0 0.002425 gigahertz, 24.25 gigahertz, 2.425 gigahertz, or 24.25 gigahertz. Uh, that one is going to be C. Just adjust the decimal point over a little bit, and uh, that will give you the, the, the actual gigahertz value. Which is equal to 1 kilovolt? One one thousandth of a volt, 100 volts, 1,000 volts, or 1 million volts. That one's going to be 1,000 volts. 1 million volts to the bottom end would be a uh, megavolt. So 1,000 volts is equal to 1 kilovolt, uh, which is equal to 3,000 milliamps. 0, 0, 0. 0.003. 0 0.3, 3 million amps, or 3 amps. It's going to be 3 amps. Just, uh, again, adjusting the the imaginary decimal there over, uh, and that will give you the, uh, the proper answer. Which of the following frequencies is equal to 28,400 kilohertz? So 28,000, 28, that would be 28 million 400 which is what? That's going to be the same as 28.4, 2.8, 284, or 28.4 kilohertz. It's going to be the same thing as 28.4 kilohertz. Uh, which is equal to 500 milliwatts. 500 milliwatts, 0 0.02 watts, 0 0.5, 5, or 50. Uh, 500 milliwatts is a half of a watt, one half watt. How many milliamps is 1.5 amps? How many milliamps is 1.5 amps? An, amps is, an amp is a thousand milliamps, so that one would go to 1500 milliamps, and that's how you will oftentimes see it on batteries, usually. Uh, how many microfarads are 1 million picofarads? The little curveball in here. 0 0.01, 0 0.001 microfarads, 1 microfarad, 1,000 microfarads, or what is that? That is a billion microfarads. So 1 million picofarads equals a microfarad. Which is equi the equal to 1 microvolt? One one millionth of a volt, one million volts, one thousand kilovolts, or one one thousandth of a volt. One microvolt is the same as one millionth of a volt, so it's much lower of a uh, of, of a volt than a microvolt. Which type of the following solder should not be used? Should not be used for radio and electronic applications. 
You should not use acid core. Acid core, uh, like I said, will grow little fingers and, and those fingers will connect and short out your circuit. You use lead tin, uh, solder, rosin core, uh, if, if, uh, if available. What is the characteristic appearance of a cold tin lead solder joint? Uh, dark black spots, a bright or shiny surface, a rough or lumpy surface, or excessive solder. Uh, that's going to be a rough or lumpy so uh, surface. It's not going to be, you know, pretty. Pretty. It's not going to be pretty. It's going to be uh, kind of dull, and and it may not look, you know, real real good. Which of the following measurements are made using a multimeter? Signal strength and noise, impedance and reactance, voltage and resistance, or all of these are correct. We're going to use this for voltage and resistance. Which of the following precautions should be taken when measuring in-circuit resistance with an ohmmeter? Uh, ensure the voltages are correct. Ensure that the circuit is not powered. Ensure that the circuit is grounded. Or ensure that the circuit is operating at the correct frequency. When measuring uh, in-circuit resistance with an ohmmeter, make sure you have no power to the circuit. That can uh, cause the resistor to uh, to fry, to burn up, let the smoke out, whatever you want to call it. Which of the following can damage a multimeter? Uh, attempting to measure resistance using voltage setting, failing to connect one of the probes to the ground, attempting to measure voltage when using resistance setting, or not allowing it to warm up properly. Uh, that answer is going to be C, attempting to measure the voltage when uh, using resistance. I've never had to, to allow a uh, multimeter to warm up. That's I love that answer. What reading indicated... What what reading indicated that an ohmmeter is connected across a large discharged capacitor? Which will we say there? Increasing resistance with time, decreasing resistance with time, steady full scale reading, or alternating between open and short circuits? Uh, the answer to that one is going to be increasing resistance with time. You're going to be sitting there holding it, and the resistance uh, value is just going to continue to grow. Okay. So now we get into my favorite part of the uh, the theory, uh, some antennas. Uh, I love building antennas and, and trying different antennas. Um, and almost almost anything that's a, an electrical component can be used for uh, an antenna. So here we go. All right. A simple dipole mounted so that the conductor is parallel to the Earth's surface is a horizontally polarized antenna. Why is it horizontally polarized? Because the antenna goes out uh, horizontally like that. And this is kind of breaking down what, uh, what a, a dipole will actually look like. The direction of radiation is strongest from its half-wave dipole antenna from a high halfway dipole antenna broadside. So you'll have your antennas going out and at 90 degrees that uh, 90 degrees to uh, to the the actual radiators, that's going to be the direction, the main direction of uh, of radiation. If you look at this uh, little chart right here, the um, the center, the the actual radiators are going to be represented at 270 and 90 degrees and the the actual radiated RF signal is going to come out from 90 degrees at the, on each one of those. <clears throat> a dipole is a just a fantastic antenna. So the direction of radiation is strongest is strongest signal from a halfway dipole antenna broadside to the antenna. So here's a little bit better example. You see the the uh, the two radiators there, but the uh from 90 90 degrees from those is going to be the direction that the uh the rf is going to be radiated the most the approximate length of a six meter half wave dipole is 112 inches that's 112 inches total consisting of two what is that 112 uh, divided by two each one uh each each leg of 
what is that, 66 inches? Yeah, 66 six inches will give you a half wavelength on each side, um, totaling 112 inches from end point to end point. That's going to be a, a good length for a six meter half wave wire dipole antenna. Uh, to change a dipole antenna to make it resonant on a higher frequency, uh, you will shorten uh, shorten the radiators or shorten the, the, the wires. So you'll have to just cut those down. You can make it a two meter or even a 440. 440 will be real short. Two meter would be, you know, not too, not too long, about uh, a meter, a meter long total. So, um, but once you cut the wire that you can't, you know, you can't put it back together. So make sure you are sure you want to modify the antenna or make a new one. The approximate length in inches of a quarter wave vertical antenna for 46 for 146 megahertz is 19 inches. Um, if you look at the little symbol right there, that is the symbol for frequency, uh, lambda. So um, one quarter wavelength uh, on a two meter antenna will be roughly 19, roughly 19 inches. Um, I don't know if you can see see the antenna I have here in front of me. This one is roughly 19 inches. This goes on an actual HT itself. It's got a plug in right there. So that's one one quarter wavelength on two meters. Uh, using a directional antenna to find a path that reflects signals when trying to access a distant repeater when buildings or other obstructions block a direct uh, line of sight of path, you can. You you can use a uh, a directional antenna, kind of go around it. Hopefully, uh, hopefully a signal will go around the buildings. Um, one, and you can bounce the signal off and you know a nearby building. Maybe you can bounce it off and and to the uh, to a repeater itself. One of those antennas, uh, directional antennas, is called a Yagi antenna. That was the guy who uh, who actually invented it. It was a Yagi, so it got his name. This first one right here in this example is what we call a quad antenna. Four sides. Um, this is a directional antenna. So one of those is your um, reflector and one of them is your collector. Is that? I'm not, I don't think I'm saying that right. But um, basically, it, one, it, it's for directing the antenna, uh, the signal off the antenna. A Yagi, same thing. You have uh, this one is just a, a short one, but you can you can actually see in this coming uh, graphic here right here um, how it directs. Now this is not definitely not to scale, but this gives you a, a a representation of how a directional antenna works. And then we've got a dish also. Dish antennas are very directional. Um, listen very well from one direction but not not the other generally you will hear these called beam antennas um more that's that's what you will hear most commonly instead of saying yeah i have a yagi or i have a quad you'll oftentimes just hear people say yeah, i've got a, a beam antenna uh, to locate sources of noise interference or jamming you can use some radio directional finding equipment um this may be considered a fox hunt, or actually it will be called a fox hunt. Uh, now you can fox hunt for fun, or you can fox hunt to find problems. Um, either way, you're using a directional antenna, and you're sweeping in a certain direction, trying to find the strongest signal. And once you find it, you walk that way for a while, then you, you'll sweep again. And it's about finding you know, the precise location of an antenna or an, excuse me, a hidden transmitter or something causing uh, interference. Uh, and the locally, locally around here, one of the clubs does a, uh, a fox hunt, a, a citywide, multi-citywide fox hunt. Um, and anybody can participate. So they'll hide a, a car somewhere in a, a mall parking deck or something like that. And you have to go find it. And so they get a little bit harder each time. So, um, but it's good for practicing of, you know, finding interference or jamming or people causing problems or, you know, anything like that. The increase in signal, 
uh, signal strength in a specified direction when compared to a reference antenna is referred to as a gain is referred to as gain of the antenna. A reference antenna doesn't actually exist. That's a reference to a perfect antenna. So looking at this, um, it's going to kind of give you a, a reference of um, the direction that the, the signal is actually going to be going out of an antenna. A properly mounted 5 8 5 8 wavelength antenna for VHF or UHF mobile service offers a lower takeoff angle of radiation and more gain than a quarter wave antenna and usually provides improved coverage. So I used to have a 5 8 wave 2 meter antenna on top of a truck that I used to have and it performed absolutely great. So when you are using a quarter wave, if I remember right, it's got like a a 12 degree takeoff angle. So the, you know, you've got your antenna here and the signal is actually radiating kind of at 12 degrees, uh, where if you have a five eighths wave, it's, it's more along the horizon. So you get a little bit better coverage along the ground. They both have their, uh, the benefits. And so, um, that is uh, one of the one of the benefits there. You can you can see in this little chart it it gives you a, a view of a, a quarter wavelength monopole compared to a five eighth wave monopole. Every antenna acts differently, uh, has its own properties. Horizontal antenna polarization is normally used for long distance weak signal CW and single sideband contacts using VHF and, and VHF bands. Um, it is surprisingly difficult to use a vertically polarized antenna for VHF and UHF. Um, I don't know exactly why, but that's the results that I've encountered and I've also been told. So signals can be significantly weaker if the antenna is at the opposite ends of a VHF or UHF line of a radio link are not using same same polarization. So if I have an ant one antenna um, and then another antenna, they will generally receive each other very very well. If one is horizontal and one is is vertical, you may you may not actually receive anything. Uh, when you see on uh, televisions, um, whenever they're holding the the microphone upside down and the antenna is going down, they're not actually talking to anybody. Um, that antenna is going straight into their hand and straight into the ground. So polarization and, and the direction that you keep your antenna is actually critical when you you want to talk compared to uh, when you're acting like you're talking. So keep the antennas the same if possible. Otherwise, you will have a difficulty uh, hearing the other person. A, a type of loading uh, a type of loading when referring to an antenna, an antenna when an inductor is inserted into the radiating portion of the antenna to make it electrically longer, electrically longer is called a loading coil. And this is where, going back a little bit, I was saying that you will find inductors on antennas. The sole purpose is to electrically make that antenna longer. So that way you can have an HF antenna on your car that's only, you know, six feet tall but electrically it may be 75 meters long or you know whatever the quarter rate you know 20 meters long 40 meters long um so that's what uh we will use um loading coils for or inductors for in antennas frequently three examples here uh like i said these these are making the uh the actual antenna electrically longer. <laughs> Sorry, but I meant to put those up a little bit sooner as I was talking about them. So which of the following describes a simple dipole oriented parallel to Earth's surface? A ground wave antenna, a horizontally polarized antenna, a traveling wave antenna, or a vertically polarized antenna? Going to be horizontally oriented on, on parallel to the Earth's surface. What is that one? That's going to be horizontally polarized antenna. In which direction does a half-wave dipole antenna radiate the strongest signal? Uh, equally in all directions, off the ends, 
of the antenna in the direction of the feed line or broadside. A half-wave dipole will radiate the strongest signal in a perfect world broadside to the antenna. Uh, what is the approximate length in inches of a six six meter half wavelength six half wavelength meter dipole antenna? Uh, six inches, fifty inches, one hundred twelve inches, or two hundred thirty six inches? Which one is that? Six meters, half of uh, half wavelength of six meters, going to be roughly one hundred twelve inches. Uh, which of the following increases the resonant frequency of a dipole antenna? Uh, lengthen it, insert coils in series with radiating wires, shortening it, or adding capacitive loading to the ends of the radiating wires. Which one of those will increase the resonant frequency? So we're going to go higher in frequency. Higher in frequency means a shorter wavelength. So we will be shortening it to go to a higher frequency. What is the approximate length in inches of a quarter wave vertical antenna for 146 megahertz? 112 inches, 50 inches, 19 or 12 inches. For 146 megahertz, it's roughly 19 inches ish. It's you know a little a little bit more, but for this case, 19 inches is a nice clean number. Uh, when using a directional antenna, how might your station be able to communicate with a distant repeater if buildings or obstructions are blocking the direct line of, of uh, sight path? Change from a vertical to a horizontal polarization. Try to find a path that reflects the center, the signal to the repeater. Try long path or increase the antenna SWR. Uh, this one's going to be to try and find a path that you can actually bounce a signal off uh, off of a uh, a building or structure, and then try to get to the repeater that way. Um, increasing the SWR is not going to be the answer. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. Long path, I don't think that you're going to send the the signal all the way around the Earth. Uh, you know, the long the long way around that would uh, that would be a lot of work and a lot of kind of wasted energy to do that. Which of the following types of antennas offer the greatest gain? The 5 8 wave vertical, isotropic, a J-pole, or a Yagi? So which one offers the greatest gain? It's going to be a Yagi because that is a directional antenna. So it's taking all that energy that it's receiving and focusing, focusing most of it in one direction. So what is a beam antenna? Uh, an antenna built from aluminum I-beams. An omnidirectional antenna invented by Clarence Beam, uh, an antenna that concentrates signals in one direction, or an antenna that reverses the phase of received signals. Beam antenna is going to be one that concentrates signals in one direction. Which of the following methods is used to locate sources of noise uh, interference or, j or uh, jamming? Echolocation, Doppler radar, radio direction finding RDF or phase locking. One's gonna be radio direction finding RDF or you'll call it, you'll hear it called fox fox hunting. Uh, all three of those are good names. Which of these items would be useful for a hidden transmitter hunt? A calibrated SWR meter, a directional antenna, a calibrated noise bridge, or all of these choices. Uh, you will definitely want a directional antenna because it's if you just use a standard antenna, you're going to have a lot of problems isolating which direction uh, the transmitter actually is, or which direction it's actually you know going. What is antenna gain? Uh, the additional power that's added to the transmitter power. No, the uh, additional power that is required. In the antenna when transmitting on a higher, or higher frequency, the increased signal strength in a specific, specified direction compared to a reference antenna or the increase in impedance on receive or transmit compared to a reference antenna. Well, I can tell you it's not A because uh, I don't know if you accidentally heard me say no, I didn't mean to say that. So A is out. The proper answer is the increased signal strength in a specified direction compared to a reference antenna. That's what antenna gain is. 
What is an advantage of a 5 8 wave whip antenna for VHF or UHF mobile service? It's a little bit longer. Uh, it has a little bit more gain than a quarter wave antenna, radiates at a high angle, and eliminates distortion caused by reflected signals. It has 10 times the power gain of a quarter wave wavelength whip. Uh, it's a little bit longer, like I said, has a little bit more gain than a quarter wave antenna, as well as a uh, a lower takeoff angle. So then, you know, that might be something to look into if uh, you're interested in antennas. They're a little bit, a little bit longer, but still not too bad. Good, they're very good antennas. Uh, what antenna polarization is normally used for long distance CW and SSB contacts using VHF and UHF bands? Uh, right hand circular, left hand circular, horizontal or vertical. So CW, long distance CW, you're not single sideband contacts. Uh, you'll use horizontally polarized, typically like a dipole or something along those lines that's horizontally polarized. Uh, what happens when antennas at opposite ends of the VHF or UHF line of sight uh, radio link are not using the same polarization. Uh, the modulation side sidebands may become inverted. They receive signal strength. Receive signal strength is reduced. Signals have no echo, have an echo effect, or nothing significant. Uh, if your your antennas are not the same polar, if one of them's you know horizontal, one is vertical, you're going to have difficulty receiving signal strength. Um, it's going to be reduced quite a bit. Uh, which of the following describes a type of antenna loading? A, an electrically lengthening by inserting inductors and in radiating elements, inserting a resistor to in the radiating portion of the antenna to make it resonant, installing a spring at the, the base of a mobile vertical antenna to make it more flexible, or strengthening the radiating elements of a beam antenna to better resist wind damage. This one's going to be A. Um, electrically lengthening by in, in inserting inductors and radiating. Uh, if you want a a prime example of of this, look up a uh, a buddy pole. Buddy pole has an inductor inductors in the uh, the actual radiating element, um, making the antenna seem a lot longer than it actually is. That's just an example uh, that you can you can check out. Guys, we are making good progress. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about coax and the importance of coax and uh, and uh, why you need to, whenever you're planning your station, you need to spend time thinking about coax. So um, feed me with some good coax. Coax is going to be uh, used more often than any other feed line in amateur radio due to the ease uh, and it, doesn't really require any special installation considerations. You can you can run it along you know baseboards or in your car very easily. Uh, some examples of of coax here. These are different ones. Each one of these is a little bit different in size. If you if you look carefully, um, some of them have aluminum. Some of them have copper braiding. Some of them have aluminum center core. Some have copper. The uh, the example here has a copper braided shield, also a either a copper clad or a copper center conductor. Copper is going to give you the best energy transfer. It's it is the kind of the best uh, best of both worlds out there. Um, at the same time, copper like these um, are generally more expensive because it is a much better quality. Um, cable than aluminum clad or aluminum. The most commonly used coax uh, in typical amateur radio use is 50 ohms, 50 ohm impedance. Um, so when you're shopping for coax, you'll, you're going to be looking for 50 ohm. Television uses 75 ohm. You can use that, but you will never get your SWR down below a 2. Um, we'll talk about SWR shortly, I believe. Um, the lower the number, the better. And so make sure that you're you're buying 50 ohm uh, amateur radio coax unless there is a specific reason to get something else. Um, these are a couple of examples here. 
and a um uh, some sort of an antenna setup. I can't tell what kind of antenna. Maybe that's some sort of a horizontal beam or something like that. So as this as the frequency of a signal passes through a coax coax cable, uh, as, as that increases, the loss in the cable increases. So as you have your coax, as you are um, going up in frequency, because the the frequency is is more in has more energy and it's a shorter wavelength, you're going to get more loss out of out of a cable. So um, getting a very high grade, a very good coax is always is always in your best interest but especially if you're going to be the higher you go up if you want to do 2 meter 440 um 900 megahertz 1.2 you need a very very good coax because as you continue to go up the more loss and a better higher end thicker coax will help you kind of mitigate that down a little bit this chart right here shows some some different uh, coax types. The blue one, the RG174 right there, if you look as the uh, the frequency increases, you can see the actual loss uh, increases rapidly. A thousand megahertz, you're at, uh, I mean, this is doesn't tell you how many feet, but um, regardless, the, the losses rapidly, rapidly uh, increase with uh with the smaller coax so if you're going to be doing a long run you need to invest in good coax don't don't skimp on the on the coax that is that you may have a just an amazing radio and junky coax you're never going to get the peak performance because your coax is just uh it's it's not good it is expensive so get the best that you can you can afford that's that's what i'm going to say there you like I said, your radio may be top notch, and then all your equipment inside. But if you can't get that energy out, you're not uh, you're not doing yourself any 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 benefits. So the type of uh, end connectors that we put on um, coax standard typically is just a, a PL two fifty nine. It's this big circle connector. It's got a center center conductor on it. Those are good. They're not there are there are things better uh type n type n uh is a waterproof connector it's designed for frequencies above 400 you will uh 400 megahertz you will oftentimes find antennas with type n because it is a more robust a like I said a waterproof uh connector and its losses are a lot low a lot lower so if you look at these uh these different kinds of coax here you can kind of see rg58 is the really thin stuff um it's fine for very short runs i wouldn't go more than 20 feet uh with uh with rg58 rg8x is a little bit larger um rg8u that's a a good almost almost a half inch thick cable um so the thicker cable, as well as the material it's made of, will help determine the quality. Uh, and there's some very, very good, like um, LMR 400 is a very, very good coax, as well as uh, Messi and Poloni makes some good coax. So invest in good coax. You will not uh, be let down if you do that, compared to just buying the, the cheapest stuff that you can find. Some... some uh, um setups may require a special kind of coax that we call an air core coax um it it's similar to to just standard coax that you buy except it's um well take a look here it's it's designed for long runs high power um it's got a a hollow center conductor uh, due to this, it's got a very, very low loss. It, this is what you use for uh, repeaters running a, a, you know, an antenna up a, um, uh, running up a tower for VHF, because it is a very thick. I mean, it's not uncommon to find, you know, some air core that's as thin as a, as thin as a, uh, a pencil. Um, or, I mean, you can find some that is, you know, 
six inches wide, depending on the need. These are a couple of examples here. Um, the problem with them, they are outstanding uh, coaxes. The problem is because it's air core, um, sometimes you will experience failure if say a connector is not put on properly or the outer outer uh, um, uh, the outer plastic covering gets damaged or something like that. you get moisture contamination contamination and moisture to a coax line is a death nail if you get moisture in your coax you need to replace as much coax that has been damaged by by moisture if if that means just cutting off you know two feet of a of a run and the rest of it's good that's fine if it has contaminated the whole thing you need you need to get rid of it because uh moisture water will absolutely destroy your coax make it where you you can you can't transmit at all some sources of loss in uh the coax uh feed line water intrusion that's a, a common one, especially in PL259 coaxes. Those uh, those need to be especially taped up very, very well. Um, high SWR. Um, if you get a high SWR, what happens is um, the energy goes out and is reflected back. Well, when the energy is reflected back, it's converted to heat, and that can, that can damage uh, your um your coax if you have multiple connectors in line so if you have a you you have a, a run of coax and it's like three or four pieces that have been cut but they've got ends on them and they're all uh you know all have ends that can that can cause loss um anything that breaks the the nice continuity from one end to the next can cause loss. It may be a little bit of loss, but uh, it, it could be significant. So if you look at this uh, this little picture right here, this was just uh, uh, this this coax has has been destroyed. It's it looks old. Uh, the the outside PVC um, jacket has cracked, letting water in. So that that antenna or it's gonna be that coax will need to be replaced. Even the the copper braid has turned green. So. Um, water is not your, not your friend. It is your enemy when it comes to coax itself. The outer jacket of coax cable should be resistant to ultraviolet light. Uh, this can damage the jacket unless it is specifically um, ultraviolet uh, resistant. Even then, the you know the sun is powerful and it can, uh, it can still damage the 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 uh the outer plastic covering um the electrical difference existing between smaller and uh, larger coax cables is is that rg8 has less loss at a given frequency rg8 is a, is almost a half inch thick compared to 58 which is it's about a little bit less than a quarter um a quarter inch so there's a, a significant usually the quality is like night and day when you when you hold the two together you can you can tell the difference for sure uh the lowest loss at vhf and uhf type of feline is uh air insulated hardline coax this is a um a very expensive very very well extremely low loss heliax is another name we call it, what we call it it's it's generally um an outer outer sheath with uh um, say a copper, a copper bright where the um, insulator, and it will have a plastic separator in there that looks like um, kind of a like a DNA strand, I guess you would say, and then a copper um, center core. We call it Heliax. It's very expensive, very very low loss cable. Uh, this is not generally something that you would use at your home because the turning radius is is a matter of feet rather than you know inches because it doesn't it doesn't bend it's not designed to uh make sharp corners so you can actually break the the coax simply by uh bending it so this is something for more of a repeater or a commercial setup than it is a personal setup the instrument used to determine if an antenna is resonant at the desired frequency uh, is what we call an antenna analyzer. 
different companies out there make them. Uh, Comet makes them. Um, MFJ makes them. What is it? Digi Rig. I think it is. They make some. And basically what they do is they actually send energy down the uh, down the antenna and measure its reflectivity as well as its ohms. You know, tells you what the impedance is. Uh, gives you a lot of information. It can tell you if a if an antenna is damaged or not. Uh, it can tell you exactly the the perfect resonate resonant point uh, of an antenna. So they're very very good pieces of equipment to have. They are uh, kind of pricey, two, three, four hundred dollars easily. Uh, but if you can get one, if you're going to do a lot of antenna work and you want to you say experiment, you you need to get a uh, an antenna analyzer. It will uh, make your life a lot easier. Don't have to have it, but it's you know one of those recommended things. So how well uh, a load is matched to a transmission line is measured in uh, SWR, and an SWR meter will show the standing wave ratio that will tell you how much energy is going out as how much is reflected. Um, and then you can calculate your SWR or uh, quite a few of them will actually do that for you. It will automatically tell you what it is. So on a scale, well, this is what a, uh, a single needle dual with dual meters. One of them is a forward and then one is reflected power. Um, and it will give you, give you those numbers uh, when considering an SWR meter you need to know the frequency and power range that you're going to be using uh, you generally can't use an F an HF SWR meter on on uh, VHF and up um, I mean you can sometimes you can but usually those are going to require two different um, antennas no, excuse, not antennas meters I'm sorry um, and inline SWR meter should be connected to uh, monitor, monitor the SWR of the station antenna system in series with the feed line uh, between the transmitter and antenna. Okay. Um, looking at this right here, this is going to be a, a typical HF station. Uh, you got your transmitter, there's your SWR, your, uh, your AT, your automatic, your uh, antenna tuning unit. Um, and then your low pass filter up to the antenna. So you can see right there where the SWR meter is. And it, like I said, what its sole purpose in life is to measure that energy going out and coming back and give you a number of, uh, of how your antenna is performing. It's important to have a low SWR uh, in an antenna system because if you get a lot of reflected energy back it can damage your radio now one thing that's nice is uh most newer radios within the past 10 to 15 years will actually be able to detect a lot of reflection back a high swr and they will actually um th throttle if that's the right word it will actually scale back its its transmitted power to keep from damaging itself. So if you're if your uh, radio you're supposed to be transmitting 50 watts and your radio won't go over 15, there may be a lot of reflected power coming back, and so your radio is is detecting that and and stepping itself back to keep from being damaged. Uh, so if you look at this, this is going to uh, uh, show you a little bit of how how the uh, the reflection works there. Um, so it's important to have a low SWR. You can get SWR meters for $40 to $50 all the way up to as much as you want to spend. Um, you need at least one. I recommend that you have at least one. And then occasionally, you know, once you get your equipment set up and it's tuned and you've got a, a nice low SWR, uh, just occasionally check it again, you know, just in case, you know, you, you, you may get water or, uh, or you you know everything may be fine, but it's just to check and make sure that everything is still right in the world regarding your uh, your radio itself. So uh, we're talking about SWR and what does it mean? So the reading of 
one to one. It is a ratio, standing wave ratio. So a one to one on an SWR meter indicates a, a perfect match between uh, the impedance of your radio and the impedance of your antenna and the feed line. When you see different readings come off of it, if you see one to one, that's perfectly matched. One and a half is is still pretty good. You're getting a little bit of of reflected. That's probably about where uh, you're gonna fall in between, anywhere between under anywhere under two to one to uh, you know one to one is 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 gonna be okay. When you start getting three to one, four to one, six to one, ten to one. Uh, most radios, if you at ten to one, will not even transmit. It will, it will detect that, uh, um, that that reflection, and it, it will be like, no, everything that's going out is coming back in. So a ten to one is also pretty much like a dead short. Um, either everything's coming back or nothing at all is going out, uh, and you might have a short. So these, this is a pretty good reference to your intent. I would try and keep it below two to one, one and a half to one or below. It would be a okay. Um, so your SWR meter will, uh, will tell you this. This is what we call a dual twin needle. Um, SWR meter, one needle shows the forward one shows the reflected. And then you have the little red lines under the two, uh, two arches there that will correspond to, uh, your at your SWR. You can also get a single needle one, one like this one right here. This looks like an older one. We'll show you the watts power, uh, the, excuse me, the power output as well. Just a a simple, nice, clean little, you know, SWR um, uh, meter there. One, one point one five, so all the way up to three, and then you start getting into the uh, the red zone, which the red zone is not good. So these are a couple different. You can get digital ones. Um, digital ones are very nice. I mean, because there's no doubting, you know, 1.4 to one or you know anything like that. With an SWR reading four to one, this indicates a, a just a flat impedance mismatch. This means that maybe you have 75 ohm coax on your radio and you need 50 ohm, uh, which does that does matter does matter quite a bit. So check your uh, your antenna, uh, your your coax. Maybe your antenna is uh, getting a little flaky. Um, so you want to, if you see four to one, you want to you, you need to start checking your equipment, find out what the, why is it four to one because you will start getting into damage mode um, on your radios. Uh, this particular radio here, this is kind of an older one. It's Kenwood. Looks like um, some of them will have an SWR meter built in, and it'll show the the rig with the external uh, SWR in here. That thing sitting on top um, is a kind of a high precision SWR meter. That, those are those are very very um, very expensive. That one actually gives you a reflected power in watts, and then you have to do the calculations but the reason the benefit to that is it's a very high precision uh, instrument to protect the solid state output um, amplifier transistors most solid state transmitter transmitters or you know most that built within the past say 15 years they will reduce their power output as SWR increases so as it increases you'll you'll also notice on your radio, that it's decreasing the actual amount of power that it's it's uh, sending out. That way, it, it's protecting itself. Um, if you are doing readings for SWR and it's you're getting these sporadic readings, you probably have a loose connection. So start start with the basics. Check your connectors and things like that, because um, your SWR should not be sporadic. Even even if you don't have a good mismatch or if you've got a, a, a mismatch, it should never be sporadic. That's usually the indicator of some sort of a loose connector, uh, loose, maybe loose uh, solder joint on your connectors or, um, you know, maybe a squirrel has been through. Some, it's, it's the indicator something has gone awry and you need to check it out to figure out what it is exactly is is the problem. A directional watt meter is what uh, 
what we see here. These are, um, we saw those just a minute ago, the bird systems. Um, these are very high precision watt meters. Um, this will also do more than just help you with the SWR. They will do other power things, but um, a directional watt meter, it's going to be an instrument other than an SWR meter that could be used to determine if a feed line and antenna are properly matched. These only give you, depending on if you look at the little slug down there in the, in the on the bottom of that, turning it which direction, it only tells you how much power it is is detecting, and that could be sending or receiving, depending on which direction that arrow, that slug, actually comes out and you turn it around, depending on which way that slug is. So like I said, they're very high precision, they're very expensive, and you have to do a little bit more. But if you if precision is what you need, this is this is the best the best way to go. And then you do the calculations yourself. Uh, another way um do it is using this this one is kind of it's an older one but it it will do the same thing it will give you either the reflected or the transmitted watts and then you do that calculation yourself depending on uh the switch um the power loss in feed line is converted to heat so if you do have a uh, high swr there's a good chance it's depending on if you've got a lot of power being transmitted especially in a radio that maybe doesn't govern itself uh you can pick up the the the, the cable and it there's a really good chance that it may be hot if you've got a high swr so you want to make sure this is something that it's kind of the scary thing but once you figure out you know how how an antenna is supposed to work and impedance and you've got you know everything's everything's good you generally don't have any kind of issue and you just want to test it every once in a while um we also have some equipment called an automatic or an antenna tuner um what this does it doesn't actually tune an antenna uh, even though that's what the uh the name of it says that's kind of a uh deception a little bit and inten antenna tuner what it does is it matches the antenna systems impedance with the transceiver's output impedance so there's um inductors and there's capacitors in there and there's knobs and you twist and you turn them and you you look for the the needles to drop and when they drop you know you've got a good match between your radio and your antenna now the reason that these are important is because um antennas are not perfect by any means uh some are better than others if you do if you make a homemade say a random wire antenna um it's not generally resonant on any band um and you need an antenna tuner to get that impedance matched in order to be able to transmit on that so when you start getting into hf radio um a lot of radios will come with an automatic antenna tuner. The one I have is a dedicated tuner, um, and it works very well. The one in the radio will do good, but the uh, the the external one I have works even better. So that will be a piece of equipment that you'll want to invest in. You can get automatic tuners. You can get uh, manual tuners. Automatic tuners where you turn the knobs and you have to get it yourself. Automatic tuners have a little circuit board in there. You start transmitting and you hear knocks and turns and all kinds of noises coming out of it. And then all of a sudden it will, it will lock in on the lowest uh, impedance and you're, you're good to go. So it's a lot faster. Uh, but if you like turning knobs and things like that, get you a manual tuner. The primary purpose of a dummy load uh, moving on to dummy loads. Now this is to prevent radiation of signals when making tests, a dummy load is a, well, I mean, it's a dummy antenna, basically what it is. It can be uh, uh, something you plug into your radio. Uh, there's a, a big manufacturer out there that um, they have developed one. It looks like a paint can. It's got a whole bunch of 50 ohm resistors in there. You fill it with oil. And I think we're going to actually uh, see here in just a couple of seconds what I'm talking about. The first one is a is a um, air uh, air cooled, and then the uh, the one on the right, the MFJ. That when you 
actually fill with mineral oil, it can handle a lot more power, a lot more power than than generally an air cooled. Um, so if you're going to be testing, you know, an amp or you're going to be testing for a long time, invest in a good dummy load. Um, the one in the in the paint can is great. I mean, you you get it, you put fill it with mineral oil, and you're you're set to go. Uh, um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, and then the air core one also is is pretty good, but you may be limited on the amount of time that you can actually use it just because they they get hot they turn that rf energy into heat is way basically what it is uh dummy load consists of non-inductive resistor if you open it up it's it's kind of neat to look in there and see but you'll see uh you'll see a whole like bundles of of resistors in there and that's those get hot and it dissipates its the heat into uh into the oil in that that case so some questions here. Uh, we are doing really good on time and uh, really good on the material. So uh, let's do some questions. So why is cable coax cable the most common feed line for amateur radio? Uh, it's easy to use and requires few special installation considerations. Has a lot less than any other type of feed line. Uh, a lot less loss, excuse me. Uh, it can handle more power than any other type of feed line, or it's less expensive than any other types of feed line. Um, answer is going to be it's easy. We love as hams, we love easy things, and uh, you know if we could have an easy button for everything, we probably would. So it's easy to use and requires few special installations. Um, a soldering iron, uh, you might need a crimper, uh, but you can use a razor blade to to trim it down to what you need so um it's it's easy to put co coax connectors and things on it so that's generally what we use what is the most common impedance of a coax cable using amateur radio talked about this most common impedance is 50 ohms um what happens when the frequency of a signal in a coax cable is increased the characteristic impedance decreases, the loss decreases, the characteristic increases, or the loss increases. This one's going to be the loss increases. So as you go up in frequency, you're also going up in the amount of loss. Uh, rate, basically, not loss as in it just disappears, but it, it radiates out of the uh, uh, out of the coax, and you end up with less power getting to the antenna itself. Which of the following is true of a PL259 coax connector? They are preferred for microwave operation. They are watertight. Uh, they are commonly used at HF and VHF frequencies, and they are a bayonet type connector. Uh, that answer is going to be C. They they are commonly used at HF and VHF frequencies. They are not preferred at microwave operation. They have a high, very high loss at microwave. They are not watertight. They are a very old technology that, I mean, it's proven, um, but they are not watertight. So, um, but they are commonly used at HF and VHF frequencies. Which of the following RF connector types is most suitable for frequencies above 400, 400 megahertz? Um, a UHF, uh, type N, an RS-213, or DB-25? My favorite kind, and I, I'm probably an oddball here, but I like type N connectors. I I like the reliability of them. They are waterproof. They're good for very high frequencies. Um, I prefer them over PL259s, even though just about everything I have has a uh, a PL259 on. Type N uh, is good for 400 megahertz and above. It's got a very low loss. Uh, what is a disadvantage of what is the advantage of a all I don't know what that word is. What is a different this is a disadvantage of air core coax cable when compared to foam or solid dielectric types? Uh, it has more loss per foot. It cannot be used for VHF or UHF antennas. It requires special techniques to prevent moisture in the cable. Um, and it cannot be used at it cannot be used at below freezing temperatures. 
Temperature doesn't really matter. Uh, it does require special techniques to prevent moisture in the cable. So uh, once you get your ends put on, you may have to wrap that with uh, uh, tape, some sort of a sealing tape and and cover it with, uh, with some sort of tar to keep water out because they are susceptible. Uh, which of the following causes failure of coax cables? I'm just going to go ahead and say moisture contamination. That is uh, that is the death knell for coax cables of any kind. Not not just cheap, not just you know expensive. All kinds of coax. If you get moisture in there, uh, it's going to drastically shorten that coax life. Which of the following is a source of loss in coax cable feed line? Uh, water intrusion, high SWR or multiple connectors into one line, or all of these are correct. This is one of the, uh, all of these correct. Every one of these is correct. Water intrusion, high SWR, and then multiple connectors uh, will all give you loss. Why should the outer jacket of coax cable be resistant to ultraviolet light? Uh, ultraviolet light resistance ultraviolet resistant jackets prevent harmonic radiation uh, they can increase losses in the cables jacket uh, RF signals can mix causing interference or ultraviolet light can damage the jacket and allow water into the cable that one's going to be it's gonna, they can allow water in the cable so um, generally if you get like direct berry uh, cables will oftentimes be um have a, have a uh, ultraviolet protection um another thing that you might do is uh if you you don't want to get something that has a a uv resistant uh jacket on it you can get some of that foil tape you know and run it wherever and put the foil tape that will keep the uh the sunlight from actually hitting the hitting that uh that plastic shell or the plastic uh outer portion and causing it to uh, deteriorate. So those are some some things that you can also do. What is the electrical difference between RG58 and RG213? Um, there's no significant difference between the two types. RG58 has two shields. RG213 cable has less loss at a given frequency and RG58 can handle high power. So RG213 uh, is, is, a, is a thicker cable and it has less loss for given frequencies, whatever that frequency is. Um, usually whenever you, you see a, a coax listing, you will oftentimes, in an ad, you will oftentimes see, hey, this this thicker cable has less loss and they'll, they'll be able to tell you um, what, the, what the loss is at a given frequency. Which of the following types of feed line has the lowest loss at VHF and UHF? Which kind? 50 ohm flexible coax, multi-conductor unbalanced cable, air insulated hard line, or 75 ohm flex coax? Uh, air insulated hard line. Generally a very, very good coax. Very, very good coax, actually. Um, they don't, like I said, they don't bend well. So it may uh, it may be hard to go around corners. So you don't generally use this type of uh, coax hard line at home unless you've got really long runs. Uh, so uh, that is something that is distinguishable about those. Uh, which of the following is used to determine if an antenna is resonant at a desired operating frequency? Um, a VTVM an antenna analyzer, a Q meter, or a frequency counter. For testing resonance, we use an antenna analyzer. What is standing wave ratio? Ration. What is standing wave ratio? Um, is it the measure of how well a load is matched to a transmission line? The T, no, no, the radio of an amplifier power output to input, the transmitter efficiency ratio, or an indication of the quality of your station's ground connection. This one is going to be the measure of how well a load is matched to the uh, to a transmission line. Which of the followings should be considered when selecting an accessory SWR meter? 
um, the frequency and power level which it measures, uh, which it measures, the distance at the meter that will be located from the antenna, the types of modulation being used at the station, or D, all of the choices. It's going to be A. A, you have to you have to know how much power you're going to transmit. These have oftentimes will have different power settings. Sometimes it's five, uh, fifty, and five hundred watts. If you transmit 500 watts on a five setting, you're going to probably uh, let that smoke out of the uh, the meter and it probably won't work anymore. So you have to keep that in consideration. Also, the frequency, uh, because if you try to measure uh, a 400 megahertz frequency on an HF setting, it will give you some kind of reading, but it, it won't be accurate because it's not uh, it doesn't fall within the calibration of them. So you need to keep your power level and your measurements uh, in mind when you're old, when you're when you're looking at SWR meters. Uh, where should an RF power meter be installed? Where are we going to install this? Uh, we're going to install it in the feed line between the transmitter and the antenna or the power supply outlet or in parallel with the push to talk line in the antenna or in power supply cables as close to possible to the radio. An RF power meter will be installed between on the, in the feed line between the transmitter and the antenna. That's going to give you your how much radiated power is coming out of your uh, out of your radio. What is a benefit of low SWR? Uh, it's going to be reduced television interference, reduced signal loss, less antenna wear, or all of these choices are correct. Be reduced reduced signal loss for sure. Uh, what reading on an SWR in a, SWR meter indicates a perfect impedance mass be, match between the antenna and the feed line? 50 50, 0, 1 to 1, or four, full scale. A 1 to 1 reading is going to be perfect. Um, as far as I know, there's not any perfect antennas out there, so you will be. You may get close, but uh, hopefully you can get a one-to-one. -one. What does an SWR, F, SWR reading of four-to-one mean? Uh, loss of negative four, good impedance match, a gain of positive four, or an impedance mismatch? It's going to be an impedance mismatch. I mean, you what you're sending out is not even probably making it to the antenna before it uh, you know, it, it burns off. So, and it's impedance mismatch. Check your coax. Make sure that it's 50 ohms. Uh, make sure your antenna, the input of it is 50 ohms and not 75 or you know 150 or whatever. Make sure that it's actual 50 ohm amateur antenna. Uh, why do most solid state transmitters reduce output uh, power as SWR increases beyond a certain level? Um, Protect the output amplifier transistors to comply with FCC rules on spectral purity uh, because power supplies cannot supply enough current at high power or to lower the SWR of the transmission line. That answer is going to be A. We want to protect the uh, the output amplifiers because those are what actually amplify. We call them the finals. Those are the finals uh, in the radio itself that's that's um, uh, outputting the the signal, and if you damage those, you you now have a receiver. You don't have a transmitter. So we got to protect those. And most radios, uh, solid state transmitters will protect themselves somehow. Uh, what can cause erratic changes in SWR? A uh, local thunderstorm, a loose connection in the antenna feed line, uh, overmodulation or overload a strong local station. It's going to be a loose connection. If you can, oh, excuse me. If you can move, uh, say your coax, and you see the needle jumping around, you're it's going to be a, a loose connection, and you just need to just double check it, make sure it's it's uh, or retighten it to to make sure that that's not going to be an issue. Which instrument can be used to determine SWR? What do we say? Voltmeter, ohmmeter, iambic pentameter, or directional wattmeter? Directional y, watt member, watt meter, excuse me. What happens to power lost in a feed line? What happens to it? You get a lot of, uh, a lot of, especially a lot of reflection back. What happens to it? 
Uh, it increases the SWR. It's radiated as harmonics. It's converted into heat or it distorts the signal. Anytime you have power loss in in uh, in a feed line, it's converted to heat. Uh, sometimes, hopefully, you don't ever experience the the you know a hot coax, but if you do, you have some significant issues that need to be resolved. So, uh, just look into what's going on. What is it? Well, what is the major function of an antenna tuner? Um, a, it matches the antenna system impedance to the transceiver's output impedance. You must have one of these if you have a uh, um, a random wire or an in-fed antenna, I believe. Um, or it's and it's nice to have one, even if you you have you know a commercial off-the-shelf radio that promises uh, whatever band you want to operate on. It can't hurt to just have the that that impedance matched directly. And that's something that the antenna tuner or the, um, uh, the, you know, antenna coupler type thing, um, you know, just have it, have it go ahead and, uh, uh, match that for you just for optimal efficiency. What is the primary purpose of a dummy load? Why do we use dummy loads, uh, to transmit signals over the air when making tests? to pre prevent overmodulation of a transmitter, to improve the efficiency of an antenna, or to improve the signal-to-noise ratio of your receiver. We don't want to uh, send signals out into the uh, into the world if we're just doing tests. So we hook up to a dummy load, and that takes all that RF energy and converts it to heat, uh, allowing us to do tests and not transmit you know, more than 20 feet away. What does a dummy do dummy load consist of? Um, high gain amplifier and TR switch, a non conductive or non inductive resistor mounted on a heat sink, a low voltage power supply, and a DC relay or a 50 ohm reactance uh, used to terminate a transmission line. It's a non inductive resistor mounted on a heat sink. Um, okay. We are just about to turn the corner here we uh we're making i think pretty good time um we're about to start safety first and uh this was this is actually going to be our last element so um let's get going here so some good ways to guard against electrical shock to your station use three wire cords and plugs for all ac powered equipment um, connect all AC powered station equipment to a common safety ground. Install mechanical interlocks and high voltage circuits. This will keep you protected um, and keep you from getting uh, a little zap. Uh, so this is a GFCI, GFCI receptacle. It's uh, designed to cut off if uh, any one of the, uh, the voltages varies at all. Uh, from the uh, from either the red or the the white right there, I believe it will it will just it'll cut off because of something. Some there's something going on. Um, this is an example of a uh, really really good grounding system. So this this grounding system has your radio, your your transmatch or your uh, ATU, which is your your antenna to your keyer, antenna switch, um, uh, your radio or not your radio, but maybe a, a laptop you might be using. This is a uh, a really good way to um, isolate that. So in this case right here, this is a a copper bar that is installed on a uh, either in the wall on the wall or you know on a some sort of uh, like a two by four or something like not a two by four, but a, a piece of plywood. Um, each one of the um, components has a dedicated connection from the equipment straight to that bar. That bar then goes out to a five or six to eight foot grounding rod that is isolated from your house. Now, the reason that this is, is good because if it's isolated from your house ground, you can't, you're not going to get any kind of, RF back into your house. And that's something that can happen if you use your common ground in, in, in your house. So if you can isolate your grounding of your equipment to its own thing, that will keep 
uh, RF energy out of your out of your walls and out of your TV and out of everything like that. Uh, use the three wire AC electrical line. Um, black is hot, white is neutral, green is gr uh, ground. Um, so that is a uh, you know, a very good thing to use there. In the United States, the black wire in a three wire 120 volt cable uh, is the hot. So we have the neutral, the hot, or the black wire, and then the ground. Going back to some fuses, um, this is a fuse or, or a circuit breaker should be installed in your house. Uh, RF energy is a funny thing, and when it gets in your house, it may pop some uh, some fuses if you have those, or it may uh, trip some some breakers. It, if for you know things are really are really crazy, so uh, these need to be. You need to make sure that you're 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 protected by uh, at least one of these at a time. The purpose of a fuse in an electrical system, an electrical circuit, is to remove the power in case of overload. That's what it does. If there's an overload, if you're pulling too much power, uh, it's going to pop that uh, that fuse to break you know break that circuit uh, in order to protect the. Uh, uh, to protect the, uh, the the cabling itself, to keep it from overheating, possibly catching on fire. If you have a circuit where the, um, let's say you have a 5 amp fuse installed and it pops, please don't input a 20 amp fuse just because that's what you have laying around. That could cause a house fire and that completely uh does away with with the purpose of a fuse it's the fuse is there to protect you so if a five amp fuse pops please replace it with another five amp not something else otherwise you could uh run the risk of a fire a hazard that might exist in a power supply uh immediately after turning it off by the charge turning it off by the charge stored in the filter capacitors capacitors like we said earlier they are designed to take voltage and store it, and they can store it even when there's no power coming in. So uh, back in the day, you were always told to avoid the uh, the capacitors in a in a uh, monitor, a computer monitor, or a television if you were you know deconstructing um, the uh, the equipment because they hold the charge and they can hold the charge for years. And so the way you get that out of there is you have to short, short that uh, uh, that power, short that uh, uh, capacitor to drain that off. So capacitors can be dangerous, especially the larger ones. So so uh, try to be careful if you're going to be doing anything with any kind of power supply. When measuring high voltage with the voltmeter, ensure that the voltmeter and leads are rated for use at the voltage being married, uh, measured. If you're, if you're for some reason measuring thousands of volts, make sure that your meter is capable of doing that. That way you don't um, blow it up essentially. So current flowing through the body, uh, through your body can cause a health hazard. Um, it can cause injury by heating the tissue, by actually warming up, your uh, your innards, your insides. Uh, it can disrupt the electrical functions of cells. It can disrupt the function of, uh, of your heart. Uh, it can cause involuntary muscle contractions. If you if you touch an electrical circuit, um, there's a good chance that your hand will clamp down until that energy is released because it's it's causing your invol your muscles to involuntary contraction to contract and you can't let go and it will in turn you just keep getting uh getting shocked so charging or do discharging a battery too quickly um can cause an overheating uh it can cause outgassing which is where it releases say flammable gas or toxic gas uh, so be careful around batteries also. You don't want to discharge them too fast because um, while they're very convenient, there are side effects. Uh, the safety hazard of a 12-volt storage battery is if the terminals are shorted, it can cause burns. That is a nasty-looking hand. I don't know how that happened, but uh, 
Um, you know, anytime there's an electrical short, they are generally very hot. You want to stay away from them because they'll cause burns, a fire, explosion. Um, it just, uh, you know, nothing pretty. It's a, it's generally pretty nasty. So if you're going to put up an antenna tower, step numero uno, look for your power, your power poles. Where are your power poles and stay away from, them. stay away from them. That's, that's the best information I can say. Um, look for those overhead wires. The last thing you want to do is come into contact with one of those and electrocute yourself or electrocute your family or uh, a neighbor or something like that. So when installing an antenna, you need to consider, let's say, if it falls, will it hit those power lines? Can it come closer to the 10 feet to those power lines? Because um, the last thing you want is for that thing to become energized. Your antenna could contact a high voltage power line, uh, power wires, if it's attached to a utility pole. Um, generally best advice, stay as far, as far away can, as you can from those. Generally power lines will also per, also provide, also give you a lot of noise in your signal just because they're high voltage lines. It's just you know a side effect. If you're gonna put up a tower, um and you're going to be climbing an antenna tower um you want to make sure that you you have sufficient training so that you know what you're doing uh so climbing a tower is more than just climbing a tower there's there's more to it than that uh use appropriate tie offs that way you if you slip or something like that you don't end up to end up on the ground um uh, you know non non non-moving anymore um wear an approved climbing harness that way if if you slip you will be caught and you won't go straight to the ground never 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 ever climb alone um i have read stories where you know somebody was climbing alone and they fell off of a tower uh 60 feet off of a tower and when they hit the ground they they were ended uh, they were forever slept, and nobody knew about it because they were, um, they were climbing alone, and they were found later on. The purpose of the safety wire through a turnbuckle is to prevent loosening of guy wires uh, from vibration. That's one of the uh, one of the things. So, you're, if it's a tall tower, you're going to have guy wires. That helps the stability of it. So, um, these are some of the observations that you need to you need to make sure you you pay attention to when climbing a tower, have a hat, have the same sun gla uh, you know, safety glasses, your harness, um, and, and you're tied off and just make sure that somebody's there with you just in case you want to practice safety when using a crank up tower and never climb it unless it's retracted. Um, or there's some sort of a mechanical safety lock device installed. A mechanic, a, a crank up tower is designed just to do exactly what it, what it sounds like you crank it up and it the outer you got the outer portion and then the inner portion portion uh lifts up and then and the inner portion of that one lifts up and it and it is able to get you a lot of height uh if you climb it without it uh being properly you know safety checked with a, a locking device or it's all the way down if you're climbing it and it slides down not only are you going to fall with the antenna but uh as you you know as your feet are in the rungs um your feet may be uh cut in half or you know with your shoe i mean it's it can it's not you know something that you uh you want to take lightly it's uh it can be a serious thing so just easiest way is to not not the easiest safest way is to lower it down if possible and then climb it that way there's no chance of it just you know, falling down with you on it Local electric codes establish grounding requirements for amateur radio towers uh, or antennas. Um, proper grounding for a tower is accomplished using three separate, at least three foot, uh, separate eight foot long ground rods. So you have a tower in some uh, in some concrete. 
each one of the legs. So in the case of this uh, this picture here, you have three legs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Each one of those legs needs to have its own grounding rod that uh, that will prevent lightning from entering your house. And that is the, the sole purpose of making sure that's grounding is to not get lightning inside of your house and make it want to go down into the ground. Not only do you get uh, each one of these um, these straps together, but make sure that they are all bonded together uh, on the outside. That way you ha you know you have a good, solid uh, ground. Bond them together with uh, external ground rods or earth connections with heavy wire or a conductive strap. If you can do a strap, that's going to give you the best, uh, the best protection. <clears throat> Excuse me. A good practice with installing ground wires on a tower for lightning protection is to ensure that connections are short and direct. Anytime, you know, make it as short as you possibly can. Uh, long runs of, of things will just kind of counteract um, the effectiveness of a of a, uh, a proper grounding system. This is a, a flat copper strap preferred for bonding. Um, you can get this, or you can get what looks like a, a grounding braid. Uh, it's braided copper, or braided uh, aluminum, or braided something um, that will give you just an excellent uh, ground. Avoid sharp bends on the ground conductors used for lightning protection. Protection. So if you can, you you know, you want to be careful. You don't want uh, over time, wind, you don't want wind to, you know, wear one of your your grounding straps or multiple grounding straps down to where they're not actually grounded anymore. Um, use a lightning arrestor on the coax feed lines. Uh, these are little things that have a gas system in it, and when a high voltage, high amperage goes through them, that gas expands and it blows out a plug, and that completely... Um, removes the connection it it works sort of like a fuse you put a new a new lug in there you have to buy a new lug put it in there but it uh it is a a good way to isolate everything uh if lightning does strike and don't skimp on those because cheap ones are cheap expensive ones are good uh factors affecting rf exposure of people near an amateur station this is going to be. Uh, we're going to start getting to exposure limits here, and this is this is kind of a weird subject, but you do need to be familiar with it. Um, some some factors affecting RF exposure of people near an amateur station: frequency, power level of the RF field. So if you're at a high frequency and you're using a lot of power, you're going to be exposing your neighbors or people around you to a high RF energy uh, uh, field, uh, the distance from the antenna to a person, the radiating power power pattern of the antenna will also um, affect that. So if you've got a Yagi antenna, you just have to keep in mind that there could be people around, and you're you know pumping out 1,500 watts, you could harm somebody. So you you've got to be aware of what's around you uh, and exposure limits. Uh, exposure limits vary with frequency because the human body absorbs more RF energy at some frequencies for frequencies than others. Your eyeballs are extremely sensitive. Um, I, I heard a new term the other day that kind of made me squirm a little bit, but uh, eyeball sweat. So if you're if you're being uh, exposed to a lot of uh, RF energy, your eyeballs might start sweating. That's kind of weird to me, but uh, that was something that I was uh, introduced recently. 50 megahertz is the frequency that has the lowest value for maximum permissible exposure limit. Uh, these exposure limit charts are available online. Um, you know, you can put exactly what your frequency is, how far, you know, how far up your antenna is, what, you know, how close to people and it will spit out all these safety numbers for you and tell you okay you're, you're 25 feet away this is of no factor so the allowable power power density for rf safety change increases by a factor of two if the duty cycle changes from 100 
percent to five hundred percent. So some of the acceptable methods to determine that your station complies with FCC RF exposure regulations. Um, this is a uh, this is one that you may see on the test right here. A calculation based on the FCC OET Office of Electrical something i can't remember what it is bulletin 65 that's one method by calculation based on computer modeling that's a very common method that's what i did or by using a field strength meter which is a funny looking little meter with a couple antennas on it and you walk around and it will measure um the the rf strength in in certain areas so field strength meter using calibrated equipment the easiest way that I have found is to use uh, computer modeling. Um, there are some pretty good websites out there that, like I said, you just put in you put in the information and it will tell you, yes, you're in compliance. No, you're not. You need to to watch out. Um, if you're not able to get your exposure uh, limits down, you may need to relocate an antenna. Um, I mean, you don't want to expose your neighbors to 1500 watts if that's what you're going to be using. That's a lot of power. And and again, your the body absorbs RF energy. And when it absorbs that energy, it actually heats up. So, um, you know, internal heating may be, may be a side effect of, of overexposure. Radio signals are non-ionizing type of radiation they're not x-rays they're not gamma rays so they don't destroy the dna uh, of your system what it does is it heats you up causes you to warm just like a microwave uh, oven in your house now you're putting the you know food in there and you're closing the door that door that door in the the casing acts as the protection um to keep you from getting warmed up uh but that's how it works you're you're injecting a lot of uh radio energy into uh into some sort of flesh and it's causing it to heat so that's that's an example of how um he rf heating works um once you move your if you move or once you move your uh your station you need to do a reevaluation um whenever an item in the transmitter or the antenna system is changed just to stay in compliance with RF safety regulations, you need to do another valuation. And I believe that the FCC is becoming more, um, oh, they are becoming more um, uh, strict on this, where you have to uh, have this. If they were to show up at your door, that this might be something that they want to see. So the duty cycle during the uh, during the averaging time for RF exposure is the percentage of time the transmitter is transmitting. So the duty cycle uh, is one factor used to determine RF radiation exposure limits uh, because it does affect the average exposure of people to radiation. Looking at this chart here, um, each one of these kind of gives you uh, a little bit of information uh, for your your maximum permissible exposure limits. Um, the station licensee is responsible for ensuring that no person is exposed to RF energy above the exposure limits. Now, I will say this. Um, on VHF and UHF, if you're using a 50-watt radio, uh, the chances of you having an overexposure uh, on your neighbors or yourself, it's going to be kind of slim. Now, if you're operating 1500 watts, that that significantly goes up, and uh, um, you'll want to make sure to do an evaluation. Like I said, you can do them online. It takes just a couple of minutes. I have uh, I have one for um, what do I have? I have 15, 20, 40, and 80 meter. They're just, just sitting on the walls, saying as long as I stay more than six feet away while I'm transmitting a hundred Watts, you know, everything is good and, and my neighbors are good. So um, it's a simple thing, but you, you want to make sure that you do it. Uh, one might receive a painful RF burn. If you actually touch the antenna while transmitting, why? Because 
the energy, the RF energy coming off of an antenna is AC voltage. Sometimes it's not just 120 volts that's coming out of the wall. Depends on the impedance. It depends depends on uh, your radio settings. There could be literally thousands of volts depending on the antenna. A um, oh, I can't remember the. Uh, it's an antenna. It's a ring antenna. Um, it actually has something like 10,000 volts concentrated in uh, on a certain area. And if you touch that, you're going to get uh, some sort of a burn. Don't want to touch an antenna uh, unless you know for a fact the radio is off or disconnected uh, just to be safe. Because an RF burn is it's like a nasty, nasty uh, sunburn instantly. So try to avoid it. Okay, so some of the questions regarding safety first. I don't know why that guy's up on the top of a, a tower with a bird, but uh, let's let's go through some of the questions. What is a good way to guard against electrical shock at your station? Um, use three wire cords and plugs for all AC powered equipment. Connect all AC powered station equipment to a common safety ground. Install mechanical interlocks and high voltage circuits, or all of the above. In this this example, it's going to be all of the above. All the choices are correct. In the United States, what circuit does a black wire installation indicate in a three-wire 120-volt cable? Which one is that? Is it the neutral, the hot, the ground, or it's just never used? The black is going to be the hot, and it's going to be the juicy one that uh, that will bite the hardest. Uh, where should you fuse a circuit breaker? Uh, where should a, f a fuse or circuit breaker be installed on a 120 uh, 20 volt AC power circuit? Uh, click that button a little quick in series with the hot conductor only. Uh, so where should it where should a fuse or circuit breaker be installed on a 120 volt AC power circuit? It's going to be on the hot conductor. What is the purpose of a fuse in an electrical circuit? Is it to prevent a power supply ripple from damaging a component, to remove power in case of overload, to limit current or prevent sh uh, shocks, or all of these choices above? It's going to be to remove the power in case of overload. So why should a 5-amp fuse never be replaced with a 20-amp fuse? Uh, the larger fuse would likely blow because it's rated for higher current. The power supply ripple would greatly increase Excessive current could cause a fire, or D, all of these are correct. It's a safety mechanism. It keeps you and uh, keeps your house or your vehicle safe from uh, excessive current. Uh, what hazards exist in a power supply immediately after turning it off? Uh, circulating currents in the DC filter, leaking flux into the power transformer. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, voltage transits tra transients from the backpack from the kickback diodes and uh or charge charge stored in filter capacitors um a power supply will have giant capacitors and they can have energy stored in there for a very long time and uh uh electrical shock from those is a real a real issue which of the following precautions should be taken when measuring high voltages with a voltmeter? Uh, you want to ensure that the voltmeter has a very low impedance. Ensure that the voltmeter and the leads are rated for use at the voltage to be me measured. Uh, ensure that circuit is grounded through the voltmeter or ensure that the voltmeter is set to the correct frequency. The answer is going to be B. Ensure that the voltmeter and leads are rated for use at the voltages to be measured. How health hazard is presented by electrical current flow through the body? How are health hazards presented by electrical current flowing through the body? Um, it may cause bodily injury by heating tissue. It may dis disrupt the electrical functions of cells. It may cause it may cause involuntary muscle contractions or all of the above. Or all of these choices are correct. In this case, it is D. All of these choices are correct.
can do all of those. What hazard is caused by charging or discharging a battery too quickly? Uh, overheating or outgassing, uh, excessive out, output ripple, half wave rectification or inverse memory effect. Answer is overheating or gal outgassing. So uh, let me just give you an example. I know we're in the questions, but let me give you an example. Um, a, a 12 volt, 12 volt lead acid car battery. Uh, if you charge it too fast, one of its byproducts is hydrogen gas, and hydrogen gas is explosive. So um, charging those is bet you want to do that in a well ventilated area. Don't don't do it in your house uh, unless. No, I wouldn't do it in your house unless it's some sort of like a very, very low trickle charge. Um, even that make, would make me uncomfortable. I would still have it outside for uh, for charging, even with a trickle charging, because that that hydrogen gas can build up and, and it's a very explosive. Uh, or it could cause the battery to overheat. Which of the following is a safety hazard of a 12-volt storage battery? Uh, touching both terminals with the hands can cause an electrical shock. Shorting the terminals can cause burns, fire, or an explosion. Uh, RF emissions from a nearby transmitter can cause the electrolyte to emit poison gas. Or D, all of these choices are correct. Talking about safety hazard here, shorting the terminals can cause burns, fire, or an explosion. Uh, which of the following is an important safety precaution to preserve when uh, putting up an antenna tower? Uh, wear a ground strap connected to your wrist at all times. Insulate the base of the tower to avoid lightning strikes. Look and look for and stay clear of any overhead electrical wires or all of these are correct. You want to look and stay away from any overhead electrical wires. They will, uh, uh, they'll get you. And that's not something that you want. What is the minimum safe difference from a power line to allow in installing an antenna? Um, add the height of the antenna to the height of the power line and then multiply by a factor of one and a half. Uh, the height of the power line above the ground, one half wavelength at the operating frequency, um, or enough so that if the antenna falls, no part of it can come closer than 10 feet to the power line. My favorite answer is going to be D, and it's the uh, the correct one. If, if the antenna falls, you want to try and stay at least 10 feet away so no part of that antenna makes contact with any power wires. Uh, why should you avoid attaching an antenna to a utility pole? Uh, the antenna will not work properly because of the induct induced voltages. The 60, hertz radi 60 hertz radiations from the feed line may increase the SWR, uh, or the antenna could contact high voltage power wires, or all of these are correct. Don't attach to a utility pole because the antenna could make contact with the high voltage power wires. Uh, what is required when climbing antenna tower? Climbing an entire antenna tower. Um, have sufficient training on safe tower climbing techniques. Use appropriate tie off to the tower at all times. Always wear an approved climbing harness. Or D. All of these choices are correct. All of these choices are correct. I would even add, uh, make sure that you're not climbing alone. Under what circumstances is it safe to climb a tower with a helper, without a helper or observer? Uh, when no electrical work is being performed, when no mechanical work is being performed, when the work being done is not more than 20 feet above the ground or never. D, never. And it's not safe to uh, to climb without somebody else there. What is the purpose of a safety wire through a turnbuckle used to tension guy wires? Uh, secure the guy line if the turn couple turnbuckle breaks. Prevent loosening of the turnbuckle from vibration. Provide a ground path for lightning strikes, or provide an ability to measure for proper tensioning. Uh, turnbuckle is going to be a, a safety thing, and so it uh, prevents loosening of the turnbuckle from vibration. Last thing you want is a guy wire to uh, to give way and your antenna come or your tower come down. Which of the following is an important safety rule to remember when using a crank up tower? 
Uh, it must be paint or must never be painted or it must never be grounded. Uh, this type of tower must not be climbed unless it's retracted for medical or mechanically safety locked devices have been uh, installed or all of these choices are correct. That one's going to be uh, uh, make sure it's retracted. Make sure it's down or you've got some sort of lockout pin or something to prevent it from going up and down. That way it doesn't fall and you don't lose your feet. Which of the following establishes grounding requirements for amateur radio tower or an antenna? FCC Part 97, local electrical codes, FAA tower lighting regulations, or UL recommended practices? It's going to be local electrical codes. What is a proper grounding method for a tower? Single four-foot round ground rod driven into the ground no more than 12 inches from the base, a ferrite core RF choke connected between the tower and the ground, a connection between the tower base and a cold water pipe, or a separate eight foot long, separate eight foot long ground rods for each tower leg bonded to the tower and each other. It's going to be D. What should be done to all external ground rods or earth connections? Uh, waterproof them with silicone caulk and electrical tape. Keep them as far apart as possible. Bond them together with heavy wire or conductive strap and then tune them for residence on the lowest frequency of operation. That one's going to be C. Bond them together with heavy wire or conductive strap. Uh, which of the following is good practice when installing ground wires on a tower for lighting protection? Put a drip loop on the ground connection to prevent water damage uh, to the ground system. Make sure all ground wire uh, bends are at a right angles. Uh, ensure that connections are short and direct, and all of the, or all of these choices are correct. Make sure they're as short and as direct as possible. You don't want to bend them if possible. That can uh, change the uh, you know the impedance of the wire and and may negate negate that uh, that protection. Which of the following conductors is preferred for bonding in, at RF? Uh, copper braid removed from coax cable, steel wire, twisted pair cable, or flat copper strap? I mean, a flat copper strap. Copper is going to give you the uh, the best uh, that best electron flow that you can get. Which of the following is true when installing grounding conductors using uh, used for lightning protection? Uh, use only non-insulated wire. Wires must be carefully routed with precise right angle bends. Sharp bends must be avoided, avoided or common grounds must be avoided. Oh, that one's going to be C. So grounding conductors for lightning protection need to avoid sh uh, sharp bends must be need to be avoided. Uh, where should a lightning arrestor be installed in, in a coax feed line? Uh, out the output connector of a transceiver, an antenna feed point, the AC power service panel, or on a grounded panel near where the feed lines enter the building. This is going to be a lightning arrestor. Usually we'll have a uh, a small grounding rod of its own with a, uh, a block on it that you plug in your your radios and uh, and or the uh, the lightning arresters themselves. So they're, they're actual physical little little pieces of hardware that go on in between uh, two connectors uh, of co on a coax line. What factors affect the RF exposure of people near an amateur station antenna? Uh, frequency and power level of the RF field, distance to the antenna to a person, radiation pattern of the antenna, or all of these choices are correct. Proper answer will be D. All of these choices are correct. All these matter in a uh, RF exposure list. Why do exposure limits vary with frequency? Uh, lower frequency RF fields have more energy than higher frequency fields. Lower frequency RF fields do not penetrate the human body. Higher RF, uh, higher frequency RF fields are transient in nature, or the human body absorbs more energy at some frequencies than others. Well, that's going to be the uh, the proper answer down there, the one that uh, is easy to say. The human body absorbs more RF energy 
at some frequencies than others. The higher you go, the more your body will absorb. At which of the following frequencies does the does the maximal permissible exposure or the MPE have the lowest value? 3.5, 50, 440, or 1296? It's going to be uh, B. How does the allowable power density for RF safety change if a duty cycle changes from 100% to 50%? Uh, increases by a factor of three, decreases by 50%, increases by a factor of two, or there's no adjustment allowed for du lower duty cycles. Answer is going to be, it's going to increase by a factor of two. That's, uh, that's how, when you go from 100% to 50 which of the following is an acceptable method to determine whether your station complies with FCC RF exposure regulations? Uh, by calculations based on the FCC OET Bulletin 65, uh, calculation based on computer modeling, measurement of field strength using a calibrated uh, equipment, or all of the choices are correct. It's going to be any of these three options above. So all of these choices were correct. Uh, which of the following actions can reduce exposure to RF radiation? Uh, relocate antennas, the transmitter, uh, increase the duty cycle, or all of these are correct. Best way to reduce exposure is relocate the antennas. Uh, which of the following actions can reduce exposure to RF radiation? I just did that one. Whoops, excuse me. Uh, what type of radiation are radio signals? Briefly said that, uh, gamma, ionizing, alpha, or non-ionizing radiation. It's going to be non-ionizing. Non -ionizing. It does not damage DNA. It, it warms you up. How does RF radiation differ from ionizing radiation or radioactivity? Uh, RF radiation does not have sufficient energy to cause chemical changes in cells, and damage, uh, damage DNA. RF radiation cannot be detected with an RF dosimeter. RF radiation is limited in range to a few feet, or RF radiation is perfectly safe. That's well, perfectly safe. Uh, proper answer is going to be RF radiation does not have sufficient energy to cause chemical changes in cells and damage DNA. That's what ionizing radiation does. Uh, how can you make sure your station stays in compliance with RF safety regulations? Uh, by inf by informing the FCC of any changes made to your station, by reevaluating the station whenever an item in the transmitter or antenna system has changed, by making sure your antennas have a low SWR, or all of these choices are correct. We're trying to stay in compliance, so we reevaluate the station whenever an item in the transmitter or antenna system has changed. Uh, we are almost there, y'all. Hang on, hang with me. What is the definition of duty cycle during the average time of, uh, for RF exposure? Is it the difference between lowest power de uh, output and the highest power output of the transmitter? The difference between PEP and average power uh, output of a transmitter? Uh, the percentage of time that a transmitter is transmitting uh, or the percentage of time that a transmitter is not transmitting. Oh, that was uh, answer C, the time that a transmitter is transmitting. Excuse me. Uh, why is duty cycle one of the factors used to determine safe RF radiation exposure levels? What is duty cycle? Um, is it, uh, does it affect the average exposure to radiation? It uh, affects the peak exposure to radiation. It takes into account the, the antenna feed line loss, or it takes no account, uh, the thermal effects of the vinyl amplifier. The duty cycle is determined because it's going to affect the average exposure to radiation. How hard your radio is working is what, kind of what the duty cycle is. 
Um, who is responsible for ensuring that no person is exposed to RF energy above the FCC exposure limits? The FCC, the station license, anyone who is near the antenna, or the local zoning board. Uh, person responsible for um, making sure that the, uh, the FCC exposure limits are followed is going to be the station licensee. The FCC puts out the standard, and you're supposed to stay within that standard there. So the station licensee. What hazard is created by touching an antenna during a transmission? Uh, electrocution, burn to skin, burn, burn to the skin. Uh, radiation poisoning, or all of these are correct. All these choices are correct. Um, the hazard created by touching an antenna is going to be an RF burn to your, to your skin, a nasty burn to your skin. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of the uh, the technician class theory. Um, I'm open to doing some more uh, Q&A if we want to, uh, Jason. That's perfectly fine. But uh, we have made it all the way through and uh, hopefully been doing some uh, uh, practice tests with uh, QRZ or A9PW or something just to, just to get you in that mode if you're intending to, uh, intending to do your test. I would recommend you just you keep doing them. You'll get used to them. You'll start to see the questions, get more comfortable. And when you're you know, getting 80% or above, you're, you're pretty much ready to test. Yep, for sure. I just uh, put the link to aa9pw.com in the chat, which is what um, I'm showing on the screen right now. So, yeah, and that, that's just, I, I don't know, that place has been around for a long time, and it's, uh, I'm pretty sure I used practice tests on that, um, not a, not when I was got a tech, but when I got my general upgrade, and that's, it was mm -hmm. 10 years ago, so, um but there's other places you can take prep for oh, yeah. practice tests as well. So yeah. That's fine. I just, but, like I said, I like that one because it, uh, it generates the test just like you're going to see it. You've got the material right. there, you go all the way yeah. through and then it grades yeah. you compared to some where yeah. it, uh, you go all the way through to where it detects that you're wrong. And then it stops you and says, Oh, you, you failed. You failed. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh PHX pilot, if I'm reading that correctly, does an AC powered power supply need to be, bonded to the same ground bus as your non-AC powered equipment and use the three prong uh, that use the th three prong plug. So in other words, does if I understand what he's asking, uh, you got a MFJ or a Samlex power supply plugged into your wall. Does it need to be grounded the same place you plug your radio in your 12 volt system in? It doesn't have to be. Um, I've heard mi I've heard mixed theories on that. Yeah, I've heard I've heard I've heard you can create ground loops by having more than one ground, but I've mm -hmm. heard that mm -hmm. it's if the one if the multiple grounds are far enough away, it won't do that. I I I need to do. I've got a guy who I've been trying to get onto the show that that's kind of like a grounding expert, and mm -hmm. I haven't mm -hmm. I haven't been able to get to reach him lately. But uh, so it's, it's, if it's, it's, possible. If you can have all of your radio equipment on on its own isolated ground, I mean that that would be that would be amazing. But we have to live in the real world. Uh, right. Sometimes that's just not possible, um, especially the way that they were presenting in here. You know, have a have a separate ground bar with a a strap to where it goes outside. Sometimes that's not always feasible. Um, my equipment right now has its own ground. And the power supply just uses my house power, I, because it's it's uh, you're going from AC to DC. I've never had any kind of you know feedback or or anything like that. It's it's I've never really had an issue. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I can't give you a definite answer, but I can okay. tell you what I've done, and that's yeah. I, I I just use house ground for that, and and but everything else is kind of on its own its own system yeah yeah that's uh that's basically how mine's done right now as well so it is an interesting topic as a highly contested topic <laughs> around hams because some people say no it has to be this way it has to be this way it has to be this way so um and, and many hams are experts so <laughs> right yeah that's true <laughs> uh in the audio world 
We like one common ground for all equipment. Some will include service ground to the ground rod. Yeah, I mean, one common ground is obviously the most, I think that's the most logical way to do it. But like Chris said, you can't always do that. Like, some guys have a lot of acreage, and they have their tower two or 300 feet from the house. And so the tower, they're not going to round a ground rod back to the house yeah. to ground it the same place the house. Nor, nor should you. It's far enough away where it won't matter, but you still have to ground the tower. So, so, some people have have wives that say you were not drilling a hole in my house. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Also, <laughs> yeah. so you have to do it in secret. No, no, that's, no, uh, no. That's right. bad advice. <laughs> bad advice. <laughs> bad advice. So, uh, once again, yeah. Paul texted me, uh, president, uh, current president of the Hearst Amateur Radio Club. He texted me uh, during this session and said, "Hey, if in, if you have anyone who's wanting to test right now." Um, I mean, not right this very minute, but is ready to take your test. They are willing to facilitate that for you. Uh, they can do it over Zoom. They can do it remotely. Or if you're in the North Texas area, obviously, they can do it in person as well. So W5HRC.org is their website. If you want to reach out to me, put a comment in this video. I'll make sure that to, to get you in touch with them. And if it's a few, and they test all the time. So it's like, you know, if you're watching this video like a couple months from now or a year from now, and you want to take a test there... Um, that's we can do that as well. So it's uh, just just reach out if you need anything else. But and it uh, doesn't have to be us. It can be uh, there's some guys right. who you know they've made a career out of testing. So that's you know they they do a fantastic job. So right. Yeah. Just whenever I know when I took my test, I went to another club down the road and I said, hey, Mr. President, I'm ready to take my test. This is the extra cost. They're like, oh, we'll do it next month. It's like no, <laughs> no, no. I need to do it extra. right now. We need yeah. to do it now, For otherwise. <laughs> So before all that stuff falls out of my head, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I get you. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Well, Chris, thank you for your time. Uh, thanks for the great information, great presentation. Um, yep. we enjoyed are, it. Yeah, yeah, I, I did too. Um, anyone that that has watched, uh, this is a three-part series. Uh, this is part three, and this is the end of it. So that's the whole material to take you through and get your license. But if you have uh, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to comment on the video. And I do watch those comments, so I still get comments on the video we did three years ago, and I still reply to those. Except if they just, hey, come by and say, hey, thank you, this was great. You know, I, I, I may or may not, I'll probably heart your comment. But if you ask a question, I try to answer <laughs> it. So, so, but that's it. So, cool. Uh, Chris, I'll give you back the rest of your Saturday. Uh, have a good afternoon. It's actually not that hot out there right now. No. But I'm sure, I'm sure it will be in a couple hours, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah today, it's you know, we're having a... Like a winter spell, it's only going to be 98 degrees. Right, yeah, 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 only in the high <laughs> 90s today. No, three Take digits. off the parka. So, that's right. <laughs> so, all right, man, you have a good one. Everyone all in right. the chat, 73, and thanks for watching us today.